Hey everybody, and welcome back to another installment in our series of companion guides to each chapter of Eye of the World, the first book of the Wheel of Time series. Now this is a series of videos for those of you that are reading the books for the first time, and it's going to have a spoiler section at the end of the video for those that are rereading the books and want to go a little bit more deep into the material. Make sure to check out all of the previous videos in this series, and again, all of those videos will have accompanying written guide with access to all of the maps on thegreatflight.com. Today we're going to be tackling Chapter 7 of Eye of the World, titled Out of the Woods. Now, all of the videos in this series are broken down into two sections, with the first section being a basic recap of the chapter. There are going to be some visuals and additional maps that are going to help you understand what you just read. Sometimes it's just helpful to have some visuals to accompany your read. This section is safe for first-time readers and will not spoil anything past this particular chapter in the books. It is designed with first-time readers in mind. The second section of the video will be spoiler-filled and will have not only a breakdown of what happened in the chapter, but it's going to get to all of the foreshadowing for the future in the books, Easter eggs, general thoughts, things like that. This section is designed for folks that are rereading the series and want a little bit more depth. Now, this entire video series is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible is the world's largest provider of audiobooks and the Wheel of Time audiobooks kick ass. It is my favorite way to reread the series. Audible is offering a free audiobook to all of my viewers. All you have to do is head to www.audibletrial.com forward slash nameless and sign up for the free trial. You're going to get a book even if you don't want to keep the service. You really help the channel by doing that anyway. So go get a free book, help the channel, helps everybody. Check out that link in the description. So let's go ahead and recap chapter seven of Eye of the World titled Out of the Woods. Now the chapter opens with Rand dragging Tam on the makeshift litter into the town of Emmons Field. He finds that the town has been attacked by Trollocs as well, and it appears that about half the buildings are burned. As Rand takes in the damage to the village, Harl Luhan, the blacksmith, comes running towards him. He calls for a Gwaynalvir, who has been helping with the other people that were injured, and Egwene comes running. Now, seeing Tam's condition, she takes them directly to Nynaeve, who is the village wisdom. Nynaeve very quickly checks Tam, opening his eyelids, looking at the wound, and in a moment that obviously pains her, she turns to tell Rand that there is nothing that she can do. Rand is crushed, obviously, but he will not give up on saving his father, and he decides to take Tam to see Bran Alvir, the village mayor, to see if he can do anything just in kind of a desperate move to save his father. Now, as Rand moves towards the Winespring Inn uh, with Tam in tow to find the mayor, he comes across Tom Marilyn. Now, Tom Marilyn is the gleeman. He's sitting on the foundation stones next to the inn. Tom tells Rand that it will be okay and that the wisdom should be able to heal his father as she's done miraculous work all night. He obviously doesn't know that Rand has already seen Nynaeve. He also mentions that the peddler, Padon Fane, has apparently disappeared in the attack. Now, as Rand approaches the door to the inn, he sees a dragon's fang scrawled on the door to the inn. Rand wonders why anybody would want to put a dragon's fang on the mayor's door, because that basically accuses people that live there of being evil, and who thinks that Bran is evil. Rand enters the inn, and he finds Bran Alvir working with some papers on the tables. As soon as Bran sees that it's Rand and Tam, he immediately jumps up to help Rand, and he sends Tom to get Nynaeve. He sends him really quickly before Rand can actually say that he's already seen her, so Tom runs out. When Rand finally does tell Bran that Nynaeve couldn't help, Bran tells Rand to get Tam into one of the empty beds in the inn. Tom finally returns and then tells them that Nynaeve won't come. He also mentions to Bran that there is a dragon's fang on his door, and Bran dismisses it, saying that it's probably just the Congers and the Coplins. That conversation turns to Moraine and Lan, who are guests at the inn, and their feats that past night. Bran tells Rand that Moraine called lightning from the sky and threw fireballs to kill Trollocs, and Lan killed many Trollocs with his sword. He says Moraine is an Aes Sedai, and Lan is her warder. Bran then mentions to Rand that there is a chance that Tam could be healed by Moraine, but he's not sure if he would take it. Tom and Bran tell Rand that Aes Sedai can heal, but that that help typically comes with conditions, and most people don't want to get involved. Rand jumps at the chance, and he sets off to find Moraine, who is on the other side of the bridge across the green, where they are burning dead Trolloc bodies. When Rand finally gets to Moraine, she is sitting there speaking with Lan about the number of Trolloc fists that have showed up. That's the, the number of Trolloc clans that have been there. When Rand approaches, Moraine asks Rand how his dreams are. He's taken aback at the question, but he says there's nothing wrong with his dreams, and then immediately asks for help with his father. Moraine agrees and they head towards Tam, with Rand telling them to hurry in a desperate attempt to make sure his father doesn't die. Lan warns Rand that Moraine is tired, 
and that even with her Angriol, something that will come up later in the books, she is still tired and wonders aloud if helping Rand is worth it. They continue off to find Tam, and the chapter ends. So that's the recap of Chapter 7 of Eye of the World. We are now going to jump into the spoiler section. The rest of this video will carry a spoiler rating of red, with major spoilers running all the way through the final book of the series, A Memory of Light. If you have not finished the final book of the series, go do that and then come back and watch this. So we'll start with foreshadowing. The first piece of foreshadowing is when Rand is entering the town and starts talking with Master Luhan about the Trolloc attack. Now Master Luhan mentions that the Trollocs came right for his smithy, like there was something of value there which kind of confused him. Rand also notices that the Cawthon house was burned. Now this is obviously foreshadowing that the Shadow is after them specifically, coming after Matt and Perrin as well as Rand at his farm. When Rand is approaching the inn with Tam in tow, Trying to find the mayor, he runs into Tom Marilyn. Now, Tom mentions a few things which sort of foreshadow events to come. First, he says that in the chaos, Pot on Fane has disappeared. Now, at the time, I believe it was meant to make it sound like he's dead, but it's actually that Pot on Fane was the one that brought the Trollocs there, and then he snuck away in the fighting. The second thing he mentions is that Nynaeve is amazing at healing, which sort of foreshadows her great ability and affinity for healing later. The last piece of foreshadowing is the question that Moraine asks Rand as he approaches. She says, how are your dreams, Randall Thor? Which is sort of a weird question, right? Obviously, dreams become a big deal throughout the book for Rand as Baal Zaman is entering his dreams, Matt's dreams, Perrin's dreams, pulling them into dream shards, etc. So the fact that she asked this question kind of foreshadows that dreams are going to be important and that Moraine knows something that they don't. So let's go ahead and move on to some general thoughts throughout the chapter. First, Hara Luhan mentions when talking to Rand that everyone will be okay and that they're going to rebuild. Now, this is very indicative of the stubborn Two Rivers spirit. Uh, the very day of this disaster, they are already talking about how they're going to move on. Again, just very good uh, world building from this regard. When Rand does talk to Nynaeve, you see the pain in her eyes uh, and in her voice when she tells him that there's nothing that she can do. You can tell it crushes her basically in the heart. But it also makes her angry that she can't heal Tam. But she does stay focused on her task. And this is something I love about Nynaeve. And it's a trait that she doesn't really lose at any point in the story. Part of the reason why she's my favorite character, by the way. Now, when Rand speaks to Tom and Bran about taking Tam to Moraine for healing, you can see how superstitious they are about Aes Sedai. And it's, it, those superstitions are super strong here in the Two Rivers because they haven't really ever met an Aes Sedai. Bran acts as if it might be a better idea to let Tam die than go to her for help which is sort of utterly ridiculous, honestly. Now, what's interesting here is Tom's reaction. Tom, who obviously has quite a bit of experience with Aes Sedai that we later learn about, he begrudgingly says that all Aes Sedai are not that bad, sort of softening Rand to the idea of speaking with her. Tom knows that they aren't evil, and he knows Moraine won't do anything awful to the boys or to Tam, but he is still holding on to his hatred over what happened to Owen, his nephew. The last general bit I think that's worth mentioning here are Land's comments to Rand after he tells Moraine to hurry. He says to Rand, I don't know that you are worth it, sheep herder, no matter what she says. Now, this is obviously about the quest that they are on, and it shows that although Land knows why they are there, he isn't sure Moraine's safety is worth the trouble for these boys, who don't even seem grateful or knowing what Moraine is about, really. Now, Moraine, however, is much more focused, and you can completely see that she is somebody who is willing to do anything to achieve her mission, which is very on brand for both of these characters. Now, there was one unanswered question or basically issue I have with the chapter that I want to mention here, and that also comes from Lan and Moraine's conversation at the end of the chapter. They are speaking about Trollocs uh, that attacked, and they mentioned that seven bands had attacked the two rivers. Then, Lan says that many Trolloc bands have not acted together since the Trolloc Wars. Now, this is an interesting statement for a couple reasons and raises some questions. For one, it implies that the Trolloc bands do not often work together or that they really never do. And if that is the case, why in the world would several bands be sent to the two rivers for this when it's really just a really small group of Trollocs that showed up anyway? It's not like there were 50,000 of them. It was a very small number. So why would they have sent more than one band? Are they trying to do forced integration and sort of diversity training with Trollocs here? Like, it just doesn't make sense that there would be seven different bands in such a small raiding party. I'm sure that this mention was there to give us the idea that something was different about these attacks. It just doesn't make a lot of sense in context. Anyways, what did you guys think of Out of the Woods? Is there any foreshadowing or points that I missed? 
please let me know in the comments of the video and make sure to stay tuned for the other videos in this series. We'll be going through all of the chapters of Eye of the World and depending on when you watch this, there may be tons of editions of this series out, so make sure to watch the entire playlist you can binge it. Also remember to head to www.audibletrial.com forward slash Naveless and get your free audiobook. Thanks to all of you for watching and until next time, peace out. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do Mistress up above, slipping on the rope of blue She prances down the staircase, a fancy us a free Crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?